Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Adult Forum. Um, great to see everybody here today. Um, great to have an extra hour of sleep last night. All of us wanted to say the days just are not long enough. Well, we got a long day. We can only say that once, once a year, I guess. So rejoining us today is our old friend now, Ian Mills, who is in Seattle, who's really glad he got an extra hour of sleep last night before having to join us now. And his presentation is Marcion and the Creation Invention. Invention will work. <laughs> <laughs> of the Christian Bible. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. It's nice to be back. Uh, with you, and it's nice to be back virtually in Durham, my uh, at Duke, my alma mater. Um, you can see my screen. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Great. So, Marcion and the invention of the Christian Bible. Um, my claim today is going to be uh, that, in some important sense, Marcion, a heretic, a notorious heretic of the second century, invented. Um, the Christian Bible. And I am not claiming by this that the Bible is a heretical idea. Um, I am not claiming by this that Marcion wrote the book of Genesis. Um, in fact, I'm not, as some, some recent scholars have made, um, how to describe these, uh, very creative suggestions that Marcion somehow lies at the font even of gospel traditions, and I'm not, I actually disagree with them. I am um, not claiming, making any of those strong claims. Um, I am, however, suggesting that Marcion had an idea about uh, Christian books, about Christian scriptures, about a way of thinking about Christian scriptures um, that uh, is meaningfully related to, is, is meaningfully the source of what we think of today as a Christian Bible. and. Uh, that it was orthodox responses to Marcion, deciding to fight fire with fire, so to speak, um, the, the orthodox appropriations of Marcion's uh, rhetorical, epistemological, bibliographic move uh, that gave us what we think of today as our Bible. So uh, it's, it sounds like a clickbaity title, a heretic invented the Bible, uh, but I think you'll find that this is a um, surprisingly orthodox idea uh, once we get past the sort of first first blush um, of how uh, potentially offensive that might sound. I want to just point out the picture in the background of this. I'm really fond of this picture. This is a manuscript image that shows up alongside the gospel prologue um, to the Gospel of John. Uh, and the original form of this gospel prologue says that John wrote his gospel against Marcion. Um, but through translation and some punctuation errors, the prologue came to say that Marcion, or it came to, it, the, the grammar shifted such that it could be read as Marcion assisted the God, John in writing his gospel, was sort of an assistant. And clearly the readers of this, of this manuscript believed that's what it said, because as you'll see uh, on the figure on the right, has had his face removed. Um, uh, and so the, the, this probably wasn't originally a depiction of Marcion, um, but some readers believed it was uh, and decided to destroy Marcion's face in the uh, image of uh, the Gospel of John. Um, I think it's, it's the closest thing we have to an ancient portrayal of what Marcion might have looked like. Um, <laughs> particularly the effacement is what makes it, uh, associates it with Marcion. So, all right, so was the Bible composed by, or not, not composed, quite not composed, was the idea of a Bible, of a Christian Bible, uh, invented by a heretic. We need to define some terms. Um, so these terms are often conflated, confused, uh, sometimes used interchangeably, sometimes not. Um, the notions of scripture, of canon, and of Bible. Now, um, I'm not trying to be a prescriptivist about how you should use these words. Uh, I understand there are different ways we might want to use these words in different contexts. Um, but the way I'm thinking of them is specifically that scripture are texts that are held up as authoritative. Uh, and, and just that. We have some text that wields some authority for an interpretive community. So we can think of scripture in philosophical traditions. We can think of texts acting as scripture in, you know, 
technical or other intellectual traditions. Um, and we can think of religious traditions that do not have anything like a Bible, who don't even have anything like a canon, um, but that have lots and lots of scriptures. Um, I'm not an expert on the Vedic traditions, for instance, but my understanding is that they have a, um, they have a, a, they have a variety of scriptures, texts that have some authority for their religious community, um, but nothing like a closed canon, nothing like a single, uh, a single artifact they could point to as being a Bible. Make sense? So scripture is not, uh, the Bible is scripture. Not all scripture is a Bible. Um, and I think this will be especially relevant when we talk about Jewish and early Christian understandings of scripture. A canon, I think, is not really used interchangeably because it does something a little different. A canon, I think, is a list. Um, literally, the word uh, is comes from it's it's the it's a it's a read. Um, it's a it's a way of measuring. It's an instrument of measure. Um, literally, that's that's what the word the word means. Um, and so, a canon ends up being uh, a list of texts that. Um, are deemed authoritative, and it is it is the texts against which we're going to measure any claim. Um, so this functions, this term functions rhetorically a little bit different, um, and I think it does something a little different from scripture, and it does something a little different from Bible. Um, so if scripture is anything that's authoritative, canon would be a list of texts against which we can measure something, um, and then Bible is the the big one, and that would be a um, that would be a list of exclusively scriptural texts, um, or not a list, but rather a collection of exclusively scriptural texts. If we we're going to say these texts and these texts only are authoritative for us, I think that's my understanding of what becomes a Bible. And so it, it, it is the act of collecting things, um, which is similar to what a canon is doing, although a canon is not necessarily exclusive, like there's classic Alexandrian canons that list the texts that they understand to be authoritative by an author. Um, there might be others, um, but those are the measuring rod against which we might measure any other authoritative text. Um, whereas the Bible, I think, claims for itself a kind of exclusivity. It is a collection of scriptural authoritative uh, texts that ha that claims to be the exclusive, you know, have an exclusive position, um, a unique position as authorities for um, understanding that interpretive or intellectual tradition. So there are my, there's my parsing, and hopefully that's the driest portion of this conversation. Um, but I think it's an important distinction because I'm not claiming that Marcion invents scripture, or Christian scripture or otherwise. And Marcion is certainly not the first person to come up with the idea of making a canon. Um, this, I mean, this probably, we, this goes back in, in pagan and Jewish traditions. You have, see, you see people making lists of, of authorities. Um, but I think, uh, but, but my claim today is that Marcion invented the idea of a Christian Bible. Um, so this is a forum. Let's pause. Uh, any clarification in terminology thus far? That, that uh, prologue, I know there are anti-Marcionite prologues. Yeah. The the one you talked about for John, that sounded more pro-Marcion than anti yeah. Marcion. No, originally it was anti-Marcion. The text, the, the uh, um, earlier forms of this prologue uh, describe John writing against heretics, including Marcion. Um, and then it was through a sort of uh, muddling of uh, punctuation and grammar that it ends up seeming to suggest that Marcion was involved in the composition of John, served as some sort of assistant. Um, I don't unfortunately have the text in front of me, so I'm kind of working off of memory. Uh, but it is only through a reading mistake that Marcion comes to be a, associated with the uh, um, the the assistant in composing the Gospel of John. All right, shall I move on? For the record, the, the background photo here, this is a canon list from Codex Clermontanus, which is one of our most eccentric uh, lists of Christian scriptures. Um, at the bottom there, uh, right below, I don't think you can see, can you see my mouse on screen? Oh, excellent. Uh, pastoribus, uh, this is, um, the pastoris. So you got Acts of the Apostles, you got uh, the Epistle of Barnabas is right here. Um, and if I remember correctly, this is the Shepherd of Hermas. And then here you've got the Acts of Paul, 
all considered uh, canon in this particular uh, in this particular um, canon list. Uh, uh, someone asked, I forget your remind me of your name. Uh, asking about the date of the Gospel of John. Uh, Dean. Dean, I apologize. Uh, Dean asks if I'm dating uh, the Gospel of John in the second century. No, um, that isn't my that isn't my claim at all. I have no problem dating John in the second century. Um, uh, I'm date for um, just that the claim about that that image and that gospel prologue. Um, that's not the Johannine prologue. It's not John one through nine. Uh, this is something that's actually appended to the manuscripts in front of the Gospel of John, uh, and it's probably a fourth, third or fourth century text. So it's a much later text. Um, uh, not to be confused with the Johannine prologue, we have one of these called the anti-Marcionite and the anti- uh, and, and the, let's see, there's, a, there's a set of different uh, prologues that get appended in the manuscripts to the front of the gospel. Um, and they're often right next to the evangelist images. So in this case, someone has paired that portrayal of the gospel of John, or the author, the evangelist John, writing the gospel with the prologue and identified the assistant with Marcion, even though it's probably supposed to be somebody else. Um, so no, I... I, I, I'm very interested in the dating of the Gospel of John, but nothing I claim today um, relates to everything I claim today could be true if if the whole New Testament was finished in the first century. Um, so I I not necessarily yeah. So we'll we'll get there. Um, okay, so Christians obviously had scriptures before Marcion comes around. Uh, just to give you a rough date, we think of Marcion as coming to Rome, this, this heretic, and we'll talk about his teachings, what makes him a heretic, uh, in the 140s. So Marcion is doing this in the um, early to mid, mid-early uh, second century. So uh, by this time, Christians clearly had scriptures. The most obvious category of scriptures they had were the Jewish scriptures, right? The scriptures to Jesus. Jesus had scriptures. Paul had scriptures. Um, they had uh they had Genesis, Exodus, they had, they had the Torah, they had the prophets, they had the law. Um, I, so at this, there's a, um, books at this time, particularly Jewish scriptures, are uh, book rolls. Um, we, I have the, the great Isaiah scroll found uh, at Qumran there. Um, and uh, to make a collection of texts when you were dealing with book rolls, uh, means something like this, right? So you walk into a synagogue. This is um, this is a uh, a book cabinet, um, a, a scroll cabinet, um, one of our earliest portrayals of one. And you see those little cylinders, those little circles. Those are uh, book rolls we're looking at head on, right? So we're looking at a series of book rolls right there. Um, so if you walk into a synagogue in the first century and ask them to show them their scriptures, what they're going to show you is not one terrifically huge roll like you might find in some modern modern synagogues. Um, the, or what they're going to show you rather is a cabinet or potentially a basket. Um, and this basket is going to be have several rolls in it. Um, it might it might have a Torah scroll. It would be a particularly large scroll. Um, or it might have a scroll of a scroll of Genesis, a scroll of Exodus. Um, scroll, uh, you know, a couple of the prophets, maybe the 12 prophets, we know the 12 prophets were sometimes combined because they were shorter texts, the, they're sorry, the minor prophets were sometimes combined uh, because they were shorter texts into a single roll. Um, but you're going to see a collection of rolls. Um, and this is important uh, because there is no cover <laughs> on a cabinet, right? There's no, there's no, ch when you're making a codex, a modern book um, that has a front and a back cover, um, you have to pick what texts are in or out of that. And once you make that decision, that's a semi-permanent decision until you decide to destroy the book and add, you know, splice in new choirs, new uh, sheets of paper. Um, so when you have to make a collection of scriptures with a codex, uh, you have to make that decision at composition and then you're done with it. As opposed to a synagogue uh, where your collection of scrolls could change day to day um, or year to year. Right, uh, someone comes along with a copy of Jubilees, what's sometimes called the um, the Second Genesis or the Little Genesis, um, uh, and you haven't seen this before, but all of a sudden you've got a new scroll which gives uh, the you know, a new revelation about um, the you know early history of uh, Israelite religion, um, and so you throw it in the basket, you add it to the cabinet, um, and 
I think this is an important like physical reality, technological reality to understand when we're thinking about Christian scriptures is there is no requirement um, bibliographically. Um, and I think we see in conversations around the nature of scripture and the collections of scriptures that exist in ancient Judaism. Um, likewise, we see when we look to uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we'll talk about in a second, um, we see a sort of a, a great fluidity in the collections of texts different groups of ancient Jews are using. Um, so uh, any questions on the point of talking about cabinets that can contain a, a, a different, different collections of scrolls um, as opposed to what we think of as our, uh, our Bible between two covers? Are there other images of cabinets that show a equally open mind for having a what we by analogy call an open canon? Uh, well, they're often not associating that directly with a canon. I mean, the, the can language of canonicity comes much later. Um, uh, but we, I mean, I'll, I'll we'll show a quote from Josephus, which both with which weighs in both directions at the same time. Uh, in a second here, the sort of uh, open mind about collections of texts. Um, likewise, we can look at Qumran, um, and then we can look at just the variety of, um, well, the, I, I think I'm going to answer your question as we move forward. So maybe, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll think about that as, um, as we, as we keep going, some more explicit evidence. Um, this was more of a sort of just like the, the idea of having, um, the, the very idea that scripture, the, the texts of script that are the Jewish scriptures were often, were, were. Um, artifactually individual. Um, that are that is, you have you have a scroll that doesn't contain the whole Jewish scriptures ever. You just have a scroll of different what we think of as books. Um, I think is a significant point to start with. And I, I mean, so there, there are so oh, okay. Well, let me move forward, and then we'll we'll sort of loop back around for that because I think that's an excellent question. So when people talk about when people try to argue that there was a solid uh, Jewish canon in the first century, they very reasonably point to Josephus's discussion against, against Appian. Um, here, Josephus is writing a sort of defense of Judaism in the first century. So this is, he's roughly a contemporary um, of Paul, slightly later. Um, and he's writing a, a description of Jewish uh, belief and practice and a sort of defense of re Jewish respectability. Um, and he gives us by far the closest thing we see in antiquity. Uh, to a to a Jewish author articulating something close to a canon, and I think there's a real sense in which this is like a canon. So um, Josephus says Greek historians have so many books, and they all contradict, contradict in themselves. When you wanted to find out about early Greek history, um, you have all these different authors, none of whom agree with one another. But look, us Jews, we just have 22 books that all agree together. How great are we? Um, and uh, these books are justly believed to be divine. divine. Um, to, so he thinks these books have a special status. They are the ones that are believed to be divine. And he's contrasting this with Greek historical records. Think of Herodotus and, you know, and all the people Herodotus is writing against and the people who imitate Herodotus writing after him. Um, uh, um, so uh, Josephus says, we have these books. He gives a list of these, these more or less more or less aligned with the Jewish scriptures that we're familiar with. Um, and then he says, it is true, the second bold passage below, that our history has been written since Artaxerxes very particularly, um, but hath not been, I picked a very archaic translation here, uh, but has not been esteemed of like authority with the former by our forefathers. Um, so he acknowledges that there are people who can have continued this act of scripture writing. Um, and we can think of texts like the Maccabees. We could think of, um, uh, I don't know, books like Tobit, things that are in the Deutero canon. We could think, well, Enoch wouldn't fit in this description, uh, although we'll see if that's relevant in a second. Um, so Josephus acknowledges, uh, so Josephus is doing something a little different than claiming for theological authorities, although he obviously believes these things are theologically significant. They're given by God. And he goes on to talk about how Jews um, will even die before contradicting these texts. So there are a sort of theological authority. Um, but his point about there being a limited number of them is specifically in contrast 
to Greek historiography, where authors often write against each other. Um, so it's it's definitely relevant to the conversation over canon. Um, but this is one author. He's not necessarily representative of all of Judaism. Uh, I mean, he's clearly not representative of all of Judaism. He's a very unique author in lots of ways, Josephus. Um, talk about him another day. Uh, he was a, a, a priest who worked as a general, fought as a general, and then ended up switching over his allegiance to the Romans after losing. Um, uh, and he is making the argument about a limited set of books, specifically in contrast to specifically emphasize how few books the Jews have in contrast to competing historians um, in, uh, in Rome, in, yeah, in the, in the Hellenistic and Roman traditions. Um, so there's a good case to be made that Jews before Christians, before Marcion, obviously, had uh, something like something like a canon. Um, at the same time, when we go to the Dead, when we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, or we look at other uh, groups of Hellenistic Jews, we see great fluidity. So this is a, a picture of Qumran, where we find alongside uh, the books that we think of as the Old Testament, um, books like Jubilees. Uh, uh, we have a few fragments of um, like Tobit, which wouldn't be included uh, in in Josephus's list. Um, we have uh, of things like the War Scrolls, the Temple Scroll, um, versions of scriptures that are retelling the Torah, um, and we know these. I mean, there's lots of evidence that these texts were regarded as scriptural in Jewish communities, and that there are early Christian receptions of those Jewish communities, Jewish communities who influenced or even possibly in some cases became Christians who carried over their diverse collections of scriptures into Christianity. Um, Ethi the Ethiopic church, for instance, uh, has preserved the book of Jubilees, which most of the rest of the Christian tradition and the Jewish tradition rejects, but this is a sort of retelling of Genesis. Likewise, Enoch, which is acknowledged as scripture um, in the book of Jude, our New Testament book of Jude quotes Enoch as scripture, um, is not is not you know canonical um, in rabbinic Judaism in in the sort of reception of later Judaism, um, but was clearly an authority for early Christians was clearly an authority for ancient Jews and continues to be an authority in the Ethiopic tradition of Christianity. So it gets received into this particular vein of Christianity as part of their scriptures, and they're not getting that from other Christians. They're getting that from uh, the Jew their Jewish uh, predecessors. Um, so we see a sort of uh, fluid, um, sort of dynamic uh, reception of the Jewish collection of texts. Um, does that sort of address your question, Nelson? We could do, go, go into more specifics, but this is not the, the crux of my um, argument today. That, that's great. Thank you. Good. Okay, so we've established Christians had, had scriptures before Marcion. That's obvious. Um, and those are all the Jewish scriptures. Uh, there's also evidence that Christians had um, Christ distinctively Christian scriptures. Um, I Second Peter is really hard to date. It's probably, in my opinion, it's the, probably the last book of the New Testament ever written. Um, and it's plausible, though not um, not impossible, or it's it's not not. Um, it is certainly plausible that it's actually that dates after Marcion. But I'm not. Um, there are other texts that make similar claims, um, like First Clement, that represent Paul as scripture. Um, that Second Peter is a nice example of what I'm talking about. So Second Peter here says that Paul wrote uh, wrote letters according to um, the wisdom given to him, uh, and that these letters are sometimes misunderstood um, and twisted by the ignorant people in the same way that they twist twist the other scriptures. Um, now this word technically just does mean like written things. Uh, so it's possible that the author of this text is just referring to Paul as alongside other texts that are written. Um, but this is an idiomatic term. The word scriptures here is an idiomatic term for referring to referring to authoritative theological documents. So I think Second Peter shows the reception of Paul's letters already as having some status akin to um, the authoritative, uh, the Jewish authorities, Jewish, Jewish scriptures. Um, so we see already before Marcion that uh, Christians, um, we can also look to the first Clement, we can look to the letters of Ignatius. Um, Christians before Marcion regard some Christian writings as having scriptural authority. Okay, there's my big caveat on what I'm not, the crazy claims I'm not making about Marcion, but it's important to set that straight. Okay, so, uh, but, <laughs> 
My claim is that these Christians do not have a canonical or what we think of as biblical, a word that comes from the word book, um, that I'm using to refer to a specific collection, um, do not have a canonical or biblical understanding of Christian scripture. And what we see instead is ad hoc collections of Christian scriptures being used by different Christian communities. I, mean, I think there are way more examples of this than I can give today. Um, but let me just run through some of my favorite examples from uh, the early second century, um, from the second century. So second Clement is a text attributed to Clement, a follower of uh, Peter, that claims, <coughs> or sorry, that um, is probably our oldest preserved Christian sermon. Um, possibly what we think of as the Epistle of Hebrews is also a reworked sermon. It calls itself one at one point. Um, but if we exclude Hebrews, uh, or so if we say, like, outside of the Bible, what's the oldest Christian sermon we have? The answer is Second Clement. And Second Clement is a very orthodox text. There's nothing heretical about Second Clement. Um, uh, it is a uh, sort of messianic interpretation of the Jewish scriptures, thinking about Isaiah and uh, pairing it up with um, passages from the Gospels. Um, the interesting thing about Second Clement is that when it, re it only ever refers to the gospel, and most of its quotations look like things that are roughly familiar to us from uh, Matthew and Luke in particular. But uh, Second Clement also quotes this passage. Um, uh, it's a, it says, The Lord saith that you shall be like sheep among wolves. So far, so familiar. But Peter answered and said unto him, What then if the wolves should tear the lambs? Jesus said unto Peter, Let not the lambs Fear the wolves after they are dead, um, uh, and uh, fear ye not that they, that them that kill you and are not able to do anything to you, but fear them after you are dead, who have power over soul and body to cast you into the fire of Gehenna. I've picked very archaic translations for my slideshow. I see. Um, the point is, this is not a conversation that shows up anywhere in our Bibles. You cannot find um, this conversation. Uh, but in one of the texts I referred to in my last talk about non-canonical, non-heretical uh, gospel fragments, uh, P. Oxy 4009, we actually recovered a copy of the gospel that Second Clement seems to be quoting. And this is more or less the exact same text. It shows the same back and forth between Peter and Jesus. Um, and an interesting thing is that here, uh, the the uh, speak the, the question is ex is named explicitly uh, is attributed explicitly to Peter. Peter responds to Jesus in this way, uh, whereas when we actually dig, dug the gospel up, we find the first person singular. I said to him, "What if we are torn apart?" Um, so the only difference, the only significant difference between this gospel we dug up and the the gospel Clement is quoting is that Clement has made explicit the the preacher here has made explicit. Uh, who the speaker is. And we see this all the time when people quote passages from the Gospels that have someone speaking but don't name it. They will introduce, if it just says I or something like that, they will introduce the name to clarify who it is that's talking. Um, what's going on here, almost certainly in my, in my judgment, is that this is a copy of the Gospel of Peter. Um, and in, in the original text that Clement is quoting, Peter is just speaking in the first person, I said, and Clement has to clarify who it is, um, substituted out the word I for Peter, which means that the earliest Orthodox sermon we have sees uh, the preacher quoting not only from what we think of today as our Tetraevangelion, our canonical gospels, but also quoting from a non-canonical gospel. And if we trace uh, for the gospel of Peter in particular forward through history, um, we see that this is a, a widespread phenomenon. Um, Serapian was a bishop at the end of the second century. This is letter is preserved for us by Eusebius. Um, and Serapian, oh, Eusebius preserves a letter for us where Serapian says, you know, um, when I visited you, you asked me if you should read from the Gospel of Peter. And since I figured you guys are all Orthodox, I said, great, we like Peter. You can read from Peter. He says, after that meeting with you, Serapian goes on to say, I learned that there are heretics who are using the Gospel of Peter. And I went and borrowed a copy of the Gospel from them. And I read through it and discovered that while almost all of it is good, there are certain passages in there 
that could be misunderstood as teaching heresy. So because heretics are using this text, I, I, your bishop, would like you to stop using this text. And I think what this really shows is the, the approach to gospel literature. Serapian doesn't mind them using another gospel, so long as it's not heretical, so long as it doesn't teach something that's, 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 that's heretical. Um, uh, it is only after discovering that heretics use this text that he gives us a second thought. And even then, he doesn't say, oh, this isn't one of our four Gospels. He doesn't say, oh, this must be some heretical interloper. He goes and actually reads through it and says, okay, is there anything in this text that should prevent my churches from using this Gospel of Scripture? And discovering certain ambiguities and its association with, with people he considers heretics, um, it's only then that he says, no, stop reading this text. Um, and I think the thing that's really important about Serapian is he doesn't have a canon list to point to. He doesn't say, this isn't in our Bible. He says, this text is fine, and this text is not fine, um, based on me reading through the text and figuring out what's in it, and based on other groups of people this text is associated with. I've got one more example to look at, um, and then I'll pause for questions. Um, this is Justin Martyr on the left, and this is an uh, ostracon, ostracon, a pottery shard, um, that we've, uh, that I actually forget where this was dug up. Um, but the Ostrakhan gives us perhaps the goofiest portrait of Peter um, on it, uh, but calls him Peter the Evangelist. Um, and the back of it says, let us venerate him, let us receive his gospel. So Peter here is identified as a gospel author. And when we read Justin Martyr, who is a great opponent of Marcion in the, in the second century, he's our first author who writes explicitly against Marcion. Um, and he is a defender of what we think of as Orthodox Christianity. Um, he is not, Justin is, you know, he's a saint, right? Um, Justin himself quotes, uh, he call, Justin himself says, um, some people call the Gospels Gospels. I don't like to call them that. He says, I call them memoirs because that's what books about Socrates are called. And Justin is saying uh, Christianity is a philosophy. Um, but at one point he quotes the memoir of Peter. Um, so Justin himself quotes non-canonical texts, including the Gospel of Peter, sort of as is appropriate in his understanding of uh, Gospel literature. So just tracing the Gospel of Peter up er, from our earliest sermon uh, through Second Clement, um, through the interaction in Antioch with, with Serapion, um, up through Justin and the sort of late antique reception in this Ostracon, um, we can see that the approach to Gospels is not that there's a particular collection that you have to use. It's not that there's a set of uniquely authoritative Gospels. We don't seem to have a canon or a Bible of Gospels at this point, um, but rather people use different books as are appropriate. I guess there's one more note I should add before I pause for questions. Uh, a scholar uh, and a friend of mine, Michael Dormandy, has recently done a study of book collections in early Christianity, and what he showed is that even after Christians developed this idea of a fourfold, uh, fourfold gospel, um, most gospels continued to be bound as individual individual codices, as individual books, up through the fourth century. Um, so just like that Jewish collection basket of scrolls, um, it seems that gospels, even after they did develop a canon, continued to be treated as individual artifacts. Um, that you know you could flip the order of, or you know it would could be added or subtracted from a a, a book cabinet, um, just like the Jewish scrolls. Okay, so there's my argument that we have ad hoc collections of gospels in the second century. Um, any clarifying questions on that? I'm um, curious uh, about the idea that the gospels appeared in. Uh, Separate, just separately. I know yep. we have those uh, uh, fragments of P52 and P66 that are just John, but yep. other than th that, you know, by the uh, P45 is a collection. Mm. Uh, do, do we have any other substantial evidence to? Uh, it seems at least by very early third, perhaps late second century, we're we're having collections of gospels. I'm yes. just wondering how do we have 
uh, manuscript evidence for separate gospels yep. other than John before that. Yep. No. So, um, Dormandy is the guy for this. Uh, his his publications on that. I'd be happy to share that with you. It is true that we have uh, early collections of multiple gospels. Um, but Dormandy shows just just looking at the raw numbers where you can tell based on things like page numbers and um, you know other other evidence uh, where you can tell gospels seem to have circulated um, individually primarily, and then it, it gradually shifts as you move through the 3rd and 4th century, where we see increasing numbers of multi-gospel uh, codices. So I'm just completely depending on his numbers. I'd be happy to share his publication, but it's it's gone through peer review. I mean, it's 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 his work um, on this is, is mere tabulation of surviving artifacts, um, and it's a very methodologically cautious uh, argument. He excludes, for instance, P52, you can't make a judgment, right? P52 is a tiny little fragment of the Gospel of John. We have no idea if that was part of a complete Bible or a, or just, just a mere copy of the Gospel of John. Um, he only counts places where we actually can tell whether or not this was part of a collection or whether or not this was a uh, freestanding or single standing or partial um, collection of Gospels. Um, and I'm just, I'm just relying on his numbers there, but I'd be happy to send that along. Um, one other thing I wondered is that uh, you had the, the Josephus uh, canon there. Is uh, Ben Sarah mm -hmm. a canon toward the toward the end of uh, his book, or or at least says, and I'm, my, I'm just calling this from memory. I don't. <laughs> Isn't the, isn't the Ben Sira the long list of names where he gives a na he names all these characters and they more or less correspond to what we think of as our scriptures? So he does uh, yeah. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So and it seems like there were twenty two of them. Yeah, I, I I have to go revisit that. No, I I I agree. Um, I I I am not suggesting that Jewish people didn't have um sort of limitations and didn't have disputes over what books they considered authoritative or not. Um, there's just also evidence of obviously fluidity in that collection. Um, and it seems to me that early Christians uh, took over different Jewish collections into their communities. I mean, I think there's lots of evidence for this. Um, you know, certain Christians quoting Enoch, certain Christians rejecting Enoch. We know there were Christians into the second, third, fourth century that used texts like the Ascension of Isaiah. Um, still large groups of Christians in Alexandria using that. So different Christians adopted different canons from uh, their Jewish predecessors. Um, and that this didn't uh, translate over into having a Christian canon immediately. So they did They did have sort of collections and potentially even, um, or, you know, you can go to Melito of Sardis, right, to see a sort of canon list of Jewish scriptures. But Melito doesn't give us a canon list of Christian scriptures. Um, and I think that's the real the real key is we don't see Christians in the second century um, making canons. I mean, obviously, we're going to talk about Irenaeus. That's obviously where this conversation is headed, right? But uh, don't see Christians making canon lists of um, Christian scriptures until in response to Marcion. Does that help with clarification? Yeah, I, uh, let me ask this. Uh, maybe this is a big question. The idea that the Christian canon emerges as a reaction to Marcion. Yep. Do you have, um, you know, and I've learned that way back, uh, but was, is this the idea of a 19th century German scholar, or is this idea to be found anywhere in Irenaeus or Tertullian or other people who write extensively about Martian. I'll let you decide. I'm going to give you the quote. And I, I mean, yes, obviously, this is a, a, a this is I mean, a theory that goes back to the 19th century um, a German scholarship. Uh, but um, I'm going to give you the quote from Irenaeus. And my my uh, my claim is that Irenaeus gives us the first articulation of an exclusive canon list of Christian scriptures explicitly in contradist contradistinction from Marcion. So um, I, you can judge for yourself, but I, I, I think we're going to address that, the evidence that would bear directly on your question in a second. Okay. So, yep. Um, 
Okay. So now we need to bring Marcion onto the stage. Let's talk about who Marcion was. Um, uh, Marcion uh, was a Christian teacher from Sinop. He was a ship owner, which seemed to have given him the ability to travel a lot and seemed to have made him extraordinarily wealthy. Um, the early life of Marcion is shrouded in mystery, um, but it seems that he traveled to Rome uh, Jerome tells us he had a letter of recommendation with him, which is interesting because later heresiologists would tell us he had been excommunicated from his church in Sinope, um, which I think probably is not, not accurate. Um, but anyways, in any case, he travels to Rome and gives a very generous gift to the church there and is incorporated into the church in Rome. Um, uh, Marcion, I'd put this picture on the screen because Marcion is especially famous for being a dualist. He believes, he, um, and this becomes a point of conflict, obviously, between him and the Roman Church, that there are two gods. There is an evil god, who I have here picked a uh, portrait of Satan to depict, um, uh, and a good god. And the good god is the father of Jesus. So this is why Marcin's a heretic, obviously. The good god is the father of Jesus, and the evil god is the god of the Old Testament. Um, so he is setting, he, so on Marcion's story, Jesus saves us from the God of the Hebrew Bible. He cites in support of his position, the teachings of Jesus. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit, for every tree is known from its fruit, he says. We'll see how this bears on the question in a second. Likewise, he loves the passage about wine skins and patches on cloth, right? No one pours new wine into an old wine skin. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the skins will be ruined. The passage goes on to say that no one sews a, a patch on a new patch onto an old cloth. And in its Matthean and on some interpretations, it's Lucan. In, so in its Matthean form, uh, and in some material tradition, this Lucan form, although there's an interesting qualification on Luke, which we can talk about if we have extra time at the end, um, uh, this passage and the way it's quoted by Marcion suggests um, that there is some conflict between the new teachings of Jesus and the old teachings of Jesus's opponents, uh, namely um, contemporary Jewish teachers. Uh, so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, Marcion then quotes, uh, in a text called the Antitheses, he contrasts this teaching from Jesus from quotations of the Old Testament. He sets these, he juxtaposes uh, Jesus' teachings and the teachings of the Hebrew Bible. For instance, in Isaiah, I forgot to put the citation on here, but Isaiah, uh, God says, um, I, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and I create evil. QED, says Marcion, God makes evil. Therefore, God must be a bad tree. That's Marcion's argument. And it's more complex. He goes on to show uh, Jesus' teachings about, you know, loving your neighbor, not hating your enemy. He contrasts this with the genocidal texts from the Hebrew Bible, texts in which um, uh, God sends plagues, things like that. He is the sort of, um, for the record, anti-Semitic uh, uh, mischaracterization of the Hebrew Bible God as, you know, the mean God of the Old Testament and the nice God of the New Testament. This is a sort of trope you've sort of heard. Um, he is sort of the font of that idea. Um, uh, that goes all the way back to Marcion. Um, and, uh, of course, this is an age-old question. Not, you know, is God of the Bible some evil God? Um, but there is, a, I mean, all the way back to Paul, we see Paul negotiating with to what extent um, do Christ, are Christians, is Christ, to what extent are followers of Jesus in continuity with Jewish practice and belief? Um, and we see Christ, Orthodox Christians negotiating this. We see this in Justin. We see um, lots of texts of people negotiating this. People still negotiate this. Uh, whether or not Christians should tithe <laughs> is an ongoing negotiation of whether, to what extent, uh, Christianity is continuous with Jewish practice and belief. Marcin, of course, took perhaps the most extreme position in the history of Christianity in actually calling this a different God and good versus evil. 
Um, and this, of course, made him a, uh, a dualist. Um, I am not sympathetic to Marcion's account of Christianity, obviously, it's just, just worth saying. We're not going to go into that. Um, it is not difficult to do careful readings of Paul and the Gospels and, uh, and the reception of the um, difficult passages of the Hebrew Bible in Christian interpretive tradition is a talk, is a, a subject for an entire, not an entire class, but an entire like series of lectures that I can't do today. Um, so we're not actually going to talk about that. But that is what Marcion, Marcion's argument is. Um, he contrasts uh, the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New Testament and says Jesus is um, Jesus is the son is the son of the good God, not the bad God. Uh, but he's got a problem um, that. Uh, if you read the Gospels that were, are familiar to us, um, they seem to have Jesus claiming to stand in continuity with the Law and the Prophets. They seem to have Jesus claiming to be the son of the creator of the universe that is the God of Genesis 1. Problem for Marcion, right? So Marcion says, uh, the Gospels were interpolated by the defenders of Judaism. He says they were Christians who took the Gospels and added that stuff in. So Marcion's going to solve that problem and take it out. Uh, Marcion gives, uh, presents to his followers a gospel that's missing the opening chapters, chapters of the Gospel of Luke, um, and that rewrites the Gospel of Luke, erasing uh, references to Jewish scriptures, to Jewish practice and belief um, that would tie Jesus to ancient Judaism. Um, so uh, he gives, he presents his followers a new gospel in a new collection of the letters of Paul, um, 10 letters of Paul. He doesn't seem to have known about the pastoral epistles, which is, a whole, again, a whole separate conversation. Um, uh, and I think what's really important with what Marcin is doing here is he is saying um, all the other gospels that are out there, and Tertullian in one place actually uses gospels plural to characterize what Marcin attacked. So Marcin says all the other gospels that are out there, um, they've all been interpolated by Paul's opponents, right? Paul writes against the Judaizers, um, the people who are getting, who are trying to compel the Galatians to follow Jewish law. Um, and Marcion says, those are the people that Paul is writing against who gave you all of your gospels. So you need to get rid of all of those. Those have all been interpolated. And here I have given you the teachings of Jesus in a single gospel and a single collection of letters of Paul um, with a conveniently uh, prefaced uh, what's called antitheses, a conveniently prefaced uh, text which will show you that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are not the same God. Um, and so this becomes Marcion's Bible. Um, I think I'm running low on time, so I want to be sensitive to that and keep uh, uh, moving forward at a reasonable pace. Um, but this is Marcion's Bible. Any questions about this text, this collection? This deeply heretical, problematic collection of early Christian scriptures. So, in my opinion, this is the first time I think we can speak of a Christian Bible, um, because he has made a collection of texts that he said are exclusively and uniquely authoritative. There, um, everything else has been falsified. Uh, we need to reject the Jewish scriptures, according to Marcion. We need to reject any other version of these letters or version of these Gospels that are out there. Um, we have here three texts, or maybe two, it's hard to say whether the antithesis was supposed to be just like a preface, like a scholar, like a, like, sort of like the front matter on lots of study Bibles today, or if it was actually supposed to be part of scripture. I'm inclined to think it was supposed to be a preface, um, based on analogies with other texts that are similar, other antithesis type texts. Um, so, uh, Marcin says these, these and these alone are authorities or scriptural authorities for Christians. So it's it's not only scripture, but it's a canon and it's a Bible. It is an exclusively authoritative uh, uh, collection of Christian scriptures um, for Marcionite Christians. Interestingly, uh, we don't seem to have any copies of these surviving. Uh, we can't, we have no surviving copies of Marcion's uh, Bible. What we do have is two authors, Tertullian and Epiphanius, two Christian authors, independently decided decided to do a sort of verse by verse refutation of Marcion. Um, and they did this in different languages. <laughs> um, and uh, so we have uh, book four and book five of Tertullian's against Marcion, 
Um, and then we have a collection in Epiphanius, um, uh, book three, I think, 42. Um, Epiphanius gives us a catalog of, uh, of problems with Marcion's uh, gospel. And then we have about 12 other authors who refer to passages that are in Marcion's gospel that he thinks are wrong. Um, so we can reconstruct basically the, the text, yeah, not only like the contents, like what works were in the Bible, that is the gospel and 10 letters, but also the actual like wording of Marcion's gospel um, for huge chunks of uh, the letters and the gospel um, using uh, early Christian refutations of that text, which is fascinating. Um, I recommend to you Dieter Roth um, and uh, Ulrich Schmid's reconstructions of the gospel and uh, the Apostolos, respectively, the, the letters of Paul. All right, shall I press on? Uh, I don't have chat visible to me, so if there's anything in the chat, someone will have to help me by bringing that to my attention. Um, I'd have to fiddle with display. Okay. All right. We have two records of Marcion's uh, sundering from the Roman church, one from Epiphanius and one um, from Philostratus. Um, and they have an interesting couple things in common. <laughs> uh, Marcion does this to his Bible, that create, creates this Bible, right? Um, and uh, we then have an account from these two texts of Marcion meeting with the elders in Rome, which just as a side note is interesting because it seems to suggest that in at this point in the church in Rome, we don't have a single presiding bishop. Uh, and there is some other evidence for this, that there seems to still be at this point a sort of college of leaders in the Roman church, um, among whom perhaps there were particular important individuals. We sort of have traditions about Valentinus in conflict, who is a contemporary with Marcion, uh, sort of wrestling for a, an authoritative position in the Roman church. Um, but uh, we don't have a single monoepiscopacy. Um, and I think it's for this reason, it's, I mean, there's a great diversity in Roman Christian practice at this time that seems to be more accepting of different teachings than we would like, we would traditionally think of as orthodoxy. Um, but that's, so, so that may be part of the story of how Marcion could be incorporated into the church uh, at first, which all of our uh, traditions tell us that Marcion was accepted into the Roman church and only after being in the church do they later part company um and there might be the sort of uh the sort of multiplicity of bishops and teachings and i would also argue multiplicity of scriptures being used in the early church so anyways apophanius tells us um that the conflict between marcion and his opponents wasn't actually over the wording of the gospel or the contents of the canon um, but rather over the meaning, the interpretation of Jesus' teaching. Uh, so it seems that despite the fact that Marcion did this, the Romans didn't come back, the, the Roman Christians, who we think of as defending more or less the Orthodox position, attacking dualism, don't come back to Marcion and say, no, you've got the wrong books, or no, you've rejected Marci Math, the Gospel of Matthew, and doing that has put you outside of the fold. That's not their response. Their response rather is, um, you've, mis you've misunderstood what Jesus said. Um, and uh, we see this consistently through the, our witnesses, our, our two, our two um, descriptions of this event. Um, that uh, what we have is a orthodox response to Marcion saying, actually the old wineskins versus the new wineskins um, can be understood in a way that doesn't imply that there's a separate evil God that we have to reject. And I think what, in my reading, what this shows is that at the time of Marcion, again, just like we saw with Serapion, there isn't an established canon list. There isn't an established Christian Bible, which um, Marcion is even able to, uh, to violate, isn't even able to disagree with that. Um, there is rather debate over the meaning of Jesus' teachings Marcion is the first person to make the move to say, hey, we've got an exclusive list of books. And the Christians don't respond to that with their own list. They respond to that by with theological interpretation, with theological argument. Um, 
Likewise, in our earliest response, a sort of later contemporary uh, of Marcion, Justin's first apology. Um, in Justin Martyr is a Roman Christian writing probably in the one, 160s, is what I think, 150s, 160s. Um, so Marcion has already sundered from the Roman church, um, but is still alive uh, and is out teaching. I mean, we see this at the very beginning. And there is Marcion, a man of Pontus, who is even at this day alive and teaching his disciples to believe in some other great good God greater than the creator. Now, Justin never mentions the fact that Marcion created his own collection of scriptures. This isn't the problem with Marcion, according to Justin. And I think this makes sense when we look again at Justin's collection of scriptures. Justin himself uses a smorgasbord of Gospels. Um, not only does he use the Gospel of Peter, which I pointed out uh, in the earlier passage, um, but he also quotes the Proto-Evangelium of James as scripture. Um, and then his, his many of his other Gospel quotations don't line up with the texts that we're familiar with. He sort of seems to have a sort of amalgamatory Gospel, um, potentially a harmony, or at least his use of Gospel is fluid, Gospels is fluid enough that he doesn't have to quote, he can quote them by sort of giving the, the right gist of Jesus' words um, that sort of combines and creatively rewrites um, the texts of the Gospels that we're familiar with. So our two earliest responses to Marcion in Rome by contemporaries, um, although Epiphanius's tradition about the Roman elders is coming much later, so that's a sort of wrinkle on that story, but Justin is an actual contemporary. Um, neither of these object to Marcion's new canon of scriptures. Um, and it isn't, we do not find anyone objecting. We can also point to Dionysius of Corinth, who objects to someone falsifying the words of Jesus, but doesn't object to a new canon list. Another text, another second century author preserved by Eusebius. Um, so there are other, there are a couple other examples we could give of Christians opposing Marcion without actually seeming to take issue, or it doesn't register with them that they should have their own canon list to juxtapose to Marcion's. Um, it isn't until uh, you're, oh yes, please. I mean, I wonder if they just didn't know that Marcion, Marcion had a canon. They don't ever mention it. I mean, I don't know how that could be. Um, if Marcion is going out uh, attacking, um, attacking other gospels and promoting his own distinctive gospel, um, I, I don't understand. I, it seems to me pretty clear that they would be aware of that. Um, and one of the reasons why I think, I mean, one of the pieces of evidence, I think it's clear to me that this wouldn't be objectionable to a second century Orthodox Christian is because Justin's own disciple, Tatian, does the same thing. Tatian creates a new gospel uh, using the old gospels and promotes this. And this gospel becomes the gospel used by hundreds of Christian churches throughout the Eastern Roman Empire. And this is an orthodox, upstanding Christian, the disciple of Justin Martyr, the opponent of Marcion, um, uh, who does the exact same thing Marcion does. But no one has an issue with it when Tatian does it. I mean, it isn't until centuries later um, that anyone has an issue with Tatian doing it, um, because Tatian's not a heretic. Um, I mean, that's, that story gets a little bit complicated in reception history. Uh, but at least Tatian is the disciple of Justin. He's on the side of the orthodox. He's an opponent of Marcion himself. His own, his own, he also wrote stuff and had his disciples write stuff against Marcion. Uh, but we have Christians in the second century composing their own gospels still, um, and no one has an issue with this. Um, their, their objection to Marcion isn't that he's written a gospel, but his heresy. Um, anyways, that's the argument I would make. Uh, I don't understand how it could be that Marcion could be involved in promoting this gospel text um, as part of his move against, you know, his move to promote dualism uh, without Orthodox Christians being aware of this. Um, Tertullian in particular says that uh, Marcion wrote his antitheses as a sort of way of promoting his scriptures to Orthodox Christians. So uh, he, see, he, he portrays Marcion as um, trying to get this text in the hands of other Christians. Okay, any other questions before? I, I am on my last my last step. So this is the end of the story. So I realize I'm running out of time here, but this is um, this is the the end of the story. Um, the first articulation we have of someone saying there are four gospels and only four gospels is Irenaeus's against heresies, uh, 
And um, Irenaeus is mostly fighting with Valentinians, another group of Christians uh, uh, in Rome at this time. Um, and Valentinians have a sort of freewheeling canon. Uh, they do use the same gospels, uh, but they also sort of add in and um, write their own texts alongside these uh, gospels. Um, but when Marcion makes the move, or sorry, when Irenaeus makes the move to not attack, so he starts by attacking Valentinians theologically. He does the same sort of thing we see Justin doing. Uh, these guys are heretics, look how crazy their ideas are, they're misreading the Bible, etc. Um, but in book three, he makes this famous move where he says, uh, we have a particular collection of gospels that are exclusively authoritative. We have only, we have four gospels and only four gospels, and this is, this is our canon. Um, he introduces this by talking about Marcion and the Valentinians and the Ebionites, other groups that also pick and choose gospels, add gospels in or take gospels out. But in the passage I'm showing you now, he has in the immediately preceding passage talked about how Marcion has sundered the gospel um, by, um, not only by mutilating Luke, which he says, he mutilated Luke, and that's a problem, but also by rejecting the other gospels. Um, and in doing this, Irenaeus says, Marcion has broken up what he should have, which is a fourfold gospel. Uh, it is not possible, says Irenaeus, that the gospels can be either more or fewer in number than they are. That's the first time in Christian history we see someone make that move. Um, uh, he who manifested to men has given us the gospel under four faces. Um, so he says there are four gospels and only four gospels. He does this in response to Marcion. And my argument is that he um, he has borrowed Marcion's own move to reject Marcion. And we see here a, a affirmation of the canon list of the orthodox of what we've received and the notion of an exclusive collection of authoritative scriptures from Marcion to uh, reject Marcion. There's my argument. Coming in two minutes and 50 seconds over time. I apologize. Happy to entertain yeah. the conversation. Thank you, Ian. Um, I don't know. Does anyone want to get a quick question in there, or we'll spend the next week writing our list of questions? For Ian, could you also could you also say that for the earliest Christians, the Septuagint was their canon? The Septuagint is a big, nebulous, fuzzy thing that also would have been instantiated in multiple individually bound books. Um, there isn't a single Septuagint. Uh, we do see sort of traditions developing about a particular list being authoritative. Um, and I have no problem there being, I think Christians probably had ideas about what books they did and didn't like from Judaism before Marcion came around. Um, what's distinctive about Marcion is him taking not Jewish texts, but Christian texts about Jesus and saying, no, we only have certain ones of these we listen to. That's the sort of innovative move on my reading of the history. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks for giving, thanks for having me with you. It's been a real, a real pleasure. For us as well, and hope to have you back soon. Great.